they actually added a race editor to this game? You can just create a race? Ah, place the start and finish line to progress in your race creation. Oh, you can place up to 300 checkpoints. That's a lot as well. Well, that's cool. All right. Not, not bad. All right, starting strong. Hold escape to leave race creator. No, I do not want to save. I think I just saved. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Anyway, so good time of day, be it morning, afternoon, or night. My name's username here. And welcome to a game, ironically, where I'm going to talk about how mad at Ubisoft I am. And uh, talk about how stupid Ubisoft is and uh, how you shouldn't buy any other games. Which is actually pretty ironic because we're starting with something that's actually really neat. I didn't know they added a uh, custom race creator to this game. That is a pretty cool addition. So, so credit where credit is due. That is pretty cool. Anyway, so... This is The Crew 2. It's a Ubisoft game. You can tell because it looks exactly like Watch Dogs 2, and it also looks like a pre-alpha at the same time. That's how you can tell it's a Ubisoft game. And uh, something else about this is that uh, this is a game that I do not own. This is a game that has been made aware to me that I, it's actually this game is on rental to me, and that is what we will be talking about today. Let me just cruise around the nice city of Watertown. Watertown. Watertown is freaking further behind Boston, you idiot. This is Provincetown, Massachusetts, not Watertown. Watertown is a different place in Massachusetts. And, uh, yeah, let's cruise around here for a little bit. I will go on a drive, but for now, I just want to drive around a little bit here in Provincetown and then, uh, talk a tiny bit about some of the things that are currently on your screen, also the fact that I'm here, etc. Anyway, so yes, this is the Crew 2, and, uh, if you're not aware of this, this is part of why I'm gonna make this video, is I want to spread awareness for what Ubisoft just did to the Crew 1. Because about a month or maybe it's two by now, about a month ago. About a month ago, they axed the crew one. I mean, oh, does that mean they like just shut down the servers? Uh, yes, but they also, it's actually, it turns out a much, it's much worse than that. Because not only did they ax it by shutting down the servers, it was also a multiplayer only game that has no offline mode. So it's now completely unplayable. But uh, worse than that as well, is they also revoked everyone's licenses from it. If you. Want to, if you want to go get the crew one now, you cannot. It is delisted from everything. It no longer exists. This is not because of licensing issues. This is just because they decided to shut down the servers. But uh, if you wanted to buy it and use like a third party new server in order to play it, you can't do that either because uh, it's gone now. And the worst part is if you owned it already, then your license is now revoked. And it's like you never bought it and you still can't buy it and uh, you still can't play it anymore. Which has uh, taken the cake for the new record of the scummiest, worst, most terrible thing that I have ever seen a video game company do as of late. So bad that I'm actually talking about it. Like this is the sort of, this is the sort of thing you're desensitized to. But now we've actually found a new low for these people. Up, oh, sorry, miss. And uh, I'm mad about it. I am really mad about it because I'm freaking fed up with Ubisoft. I am sick of Ubisoft. You know, everyone says EA is the worst game company publisher out there. But I'm starting to think maybe Ubisoft is trying to challenge them for that title. Because not only do we have this, we also have all the stuff I talked about in the Mega Rant where you have the pink, uh, where you have the mag magenta, yellow, and light blue color scheme, soulless crap, where Far Cry New Dawn is the worst offender of that. I saw a video of Far Cry New Dawn recently, unrelated, and I just, the whole thing seemed so empty and soulless, and it had that color scheme plastered everywhere. It's like, that made me mad. Hearing the crew thing made me mad, and just... Thinking about Watch Dogs 2 recently made me mad. I actually went to a grocery store the other day, and there was like, I don't know what it was or what it was doing, but there was this like drone walking up and going up and down the aisles and like scanning things or something. Maybe it was like looking for stains to clean up, I don't know. And it made me think of Watch Dogs 2, and it reminded me of how awful Watch Dogs 2 is. And so I'm just on this like, I just have all this molten distaste for Ubisoft right now that I just want to go. I want to make a video. I want to put it out there. I want to raise awareness for this. If there's at least one person that wa that's watching this who has the Crew 1, which is the first game in this series that I'm currently playing, uh, there is action you can take. I want you to be aware of what just happened to your game, if you don't already know, and what you can do about it. Because what just happened is not only terrible and illegal and immoral, it's also probably some type of illegal. But there aren't really any uh, laws for it just yet. But that's where a petition comes in. There is a website called Stop Killing, called StopKillingGames.com, link in description. That was actually put up and created by a YouTuber, just like myself. 
where uh, it's everything all about what you can do to yell and push back at Ubisoft for doing this. And it's nice and neatly organized and sorted based on uh, whether or not you actually have the Crew 2 and... Crew 2? I mean the Crew 1 and uh, what country you live in. Because as it turns out, if you have the Crew 1, that means you are eligible to... Uh, that means you are eligible to sign petitions in multiple different countries, including the United Kingdom, France, and I believe maybe the Netherlands is one? Yeah, the United Kingdom and France are the big ones. Australia, right, Australia was another one. If you have the Crew 1 and you live in one of those countries, that means you are eligible to uh, sign that petition, uh, offer your information, and say, Hey, I, as a consumer, bought a product, and then its license was revoked, and this is like a consu- this is- a consumer rights violation. It's not technically in the law books yet, but the emphasis is on the word yet. And that's what this YouTuber is doing. That's what, uh, that's what is going on currently with the Crew 1, and, uh, that's what I'm doing here, because I actually went to the site myself, and I clicked through it, and it said, do you live in the United States? Yes. Do you have the Crew 1? No. And it basically said that, oh, well, if you don't have the game, then the only thing you can really do is spread awareness on social media or other places. And that is exactly what I'm doing right here. To all the 160 something subscribers I have by now, to all of you watching this, if any of you have the crew one, go to that freaking site right now and uh, get mad at Ubisoft. Get fi get fired up, get mad at Ubisoft. Because uh, I'm already mad at Ubisoft for several, several reasons, but this one is like one of the big ones. Because the petition in the United Kingdom already has the threshold of signatures that it has enough, that it legally has to be considered by the Parliament of the United Kingdom. It already has the signature threshold. And uh, that's scheduled for, I believe, the autumn, so maybe roughly six months-ish from now. And, uh, but if there are more signatures, if it reaches a second threshold, then it will have to be bumped up and considered by the Parliament sooner. That, uh, that petition, by the way, will be essentially the, hey, European government, can you take a look at this gross violation of consumer rights and maybe consider making some kind of a law around it because that's what's currently happening in the United Kingdom and France and also Australia because those places have much better consumer rights laws than the United States and the hope is that those will be the pebble that uh, you throw down a snowy mountain that becomes an avalanche that becomes that becomes new laws towards the preservation of games because uh, I like playing older games you know I broke up the recording. Let me go get a bottle of water as well, because this is going to be one of those talky videos where I end up getting really thirsty by the end of it, so I'll be right back. As we see the nice old cinematic camera of my car fade away, got my bottle of water. Anyway, so, yes. I have to zoom out the minimap every time, don't I? So, uh, yeah, that's what's going on with the crew, and I'm mad. I'm mad because I play, I used to play this game, but then I quit it because of very... Because of a lot of different microtransaction regions, which is the street, the way to go to New York? It looks like straight. By the way, the plan for the video of what I'll be doing in the background is, uh, this is The Crew 2, it's the sequel to the game that they axed. And, uh, yeah, it's apparently a game that I'm never gonna be able to play again one day, because they'll just shut it down. And, uh, they will maybe just say, frick yourself, uh, you can't play this anymore. It doesn't work, and you can't, like... Maybe they'll revoke the license. But the good news is that a friend of mine bought this game for me in 2019. So, thank you very much to them. <laughs> That's the one! That was perfect timing! That was him. That guy on the left. That was the guy who bought me this game. The, a shout out to Dragonblade underscore zero nine for buying me this game. But as a result of that, I uh, did not spend any money for this game. Because, thank frick, I would have been completely ripped off. So, <laughs> so and yes, straight to New York. Uh, in the background, what I'll be doing is I'll just be driving around. I'll be cruising uh, from here, Provincetown, Massachusetts, because I like Massachusetts. Uh, yep. And I'll be going to New York, which is the city where Red Alert 2 begins, and I'll be driving from there to San Francisco, the city where Year's Revenge begins, because I'm obsessed with Command & Conquer. <laughs> That's what, that is what we'll be doing. And also, if you're curious at all why my car is the sci-fi-looking Lamborghini Egoista with purple glass and purple tires, that is because this is made to look like a car of the Silencers team from the Accelerators series of uh, the Hot Wheels TV show from the mid-2000s. Legendary show, highly recommend it. This car looks like it's straight from that. That's that's uh, that's the explanation behind that, if you're curious about that, all that show. Oh, thank you so much, Stutter. <laughs> Something that happened before this. I loaded the game, I started recording it, 
it chugged like absolute mad. Why do I keep having to zoom out the main map? It started chugging like mad. Nope. Oh, that was something that used to happen in this game. There was like, I think what happens is you press, you tap, you lightly tap like a directional key, but then the game stutters and thinks you're pressing it for longer than you actually are. So you end up just veering off the road at random all the time. Ah, first and many for that. Anyway, yeah. Something ironic as well about Ubisoft, as I was saying there, was, uh, thank you so much. Something as well that I was, uh, something that was very ironic that happened a second ago before I started recording. Was I loaded the game and I had massive frame rate issues, and uh, the game was chugging at like 30 FPS, so I set the graphics down to the lowest settings. My minimap is blinking, but I don't really care about that. It's not blinking anymore, yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, extremely ironically, I, uh, had technical issues loading up this game. And just, this game's like 50 gigabytes as well, it's just everything bad about games. Here it is, here you go. And I'm mad! I'm mad! I'm mad! I am uh, irritated, I'm angry at Ubisoft. The worst freaking company, essentially. It's just, I'm mad, I'm done with them. I am done with Ubisoft, I am fed up with Ubisoft, I'm never buying a Ubisoft product ever again. And, uh, I'm upset! I'm upset, and I'm here because I want to yell about it, and I want to rant about it. And I want to talk about it, and I want to, as I said, raise awareness for the petition of the crew of uh, saving the crew one. Well, maybe they can't save the crew one, but you could, in theory, save games in the future. Veered away from that guy. There's one there. Watch it. Easy. Something about this car that makes it a little difficult to drive is that it's a little heavy. Like if you drive different supercars, they turn a lot easier. This car is kind of tanky in that regard, which I guess kind of makes sense. It does look very sci-fi. But yes. I gave the recording a breakup. Very nice. So, yeah, it's just I'm mad at Ubisoft. I am really mad at Ubisoft. Everything that's been freaking... Uh, everything that's been happening has just made me mad. I watched a video of New Dawn, as I said. I watched a video of Far Cry New Dawn, where everything was magenta, yellow, and light blue. I thought about this game. I thought about Watch Dogs 2. All those games are like, they look the same, they look like carbon copies of each other. They literally look like, honestly, Ubisoft is the closest thing we have to like an AI generated video game. At this point. That's what Ubisoft feels like to me, and I'm mad about it, because this is supposed to be like a AAA company studio with high quality, but no, no, it's not really, nope. It sure isn't. It sure isn't. Pardon me, I'll just go ahead and go between there, yep. I'm just, I'm mad. I'm mad because, uh, thankfully, I did not spend any money for any of these Ubisoft games I'm referring to. But, uh, which way do I need to go to get to New York? Is that literally just New York that I'm facing? It sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Yep. It sure is. Well done. Anyway. Zoom out the minimap again. I'm just mad at Ubisoft because, like, the games that they put out, The Crew 2, Watch Dogs 2, they just feel so very, very soulless. Where's the parking garage? It's the next right. Okay. It's... I'm mad. I'm mad because this is a cool game that used to be fun, but I quit it for being corporate slop. I'm mad because Watch Dogs 2 could have been a lot better than it was, but I quit it for being corporate slop. I'm mad because Far Cry New Dawn is corporate slop so bad that I don't have it, and no one has ever thought of blowing their money on it. And, uh, it's just... We're gonna go for a drive. That was my Steam, by the way. In fact, maybe maybe I should check that just in case it's like the friend like wants to play this game or something. Just in case. Pardon me. Pardon me. I'll go ahead and explain that in a second. Auto centering this game is really bad as well. Give me a second. Indeed, it was him. So yep. Once again, shout out to Dragon Blade. Thank you very much for uh, buying this game. I'm so sorry you wasted your money on Ubisoft corporate slop, but uh, thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, also the reason I was looking at this is not because I'm gonna do this race. In fact, this is the wrong race, right? Yeah, this is like a three-minute go to Providence Town, which is where I just came from. This one is the drive to San Francisco cross-country one. It's the fun one that makes you a lot of money that I've done a lot. And uh, I'm going to drive its route, but I'm not going to actually play the race. Because this is supposed to be a relaxing video. It's supposed to be me going for a cruise, driving to San Francisco. Hello, other player. Oh, you've got a Koenigsegg. you got a police-looking Koenigsegg. Nice. Shout out to you. Shout out to you. Anyway, race starts here, and uh, please do <laughs> race starts here. If you do New York Hypercar, I will probably be doing a bunch of speedrun style skips as well. Maybe I'll try to do it normally. 
Thank you, sir, for walking by this by the frame. There's a police officer as well. Deep. Off we go. We are going to drive to San Francisco, and I'm just going to talk about whatever comes to mind, which is mostly going to be me yelling at Ubisoft, obviously. It's, yeah, I'm just, I'm mad at Ubisoft. I'm just mad at Ubisoft, because, as I said a second ago, it just feels like we've reached a level of bad quality that's gone beyond bad quality to feeling like almost AI-generated content. It's terrible. It is really bad. It is really awful how freaking far the gaming industry has fallen and how Ubisoft is genuinely trying to freaking challenge EA almost for the title of worst gaming company. It is so flippin' ridiculous. I'm shaking my head at it. As I mentioned in the Mega Ram with the magenta yellow light blue thing, which by the way, hold on, this game has that as well. It's not as invasive because it's not like the un it's not like in the gameplay itself. It's in the HUD. It's in the uh, it's in the user interface. You'll notice that there's four different colors here: uh, yellow, light blue, orange, and then over here is the magenta. I believe those actually correspond to the four different racing styles. Yes, you have street racing is yellow. You have uh, legal professional racing is blue, right there. It includes things like you know racing around uh, F1 tracks, that sort of thing. Off road, and then over here is freestyle, which is sort of like miscellaneous you'll notice monster trucks and planes are in there <laughs> yep so there's the magenta yellow and light blue this game's pretty soulless a lot different than the crew one as well this game is a freemium this game is i've never played the crew one personally and now i freaking can't because thanks to ubisoft never played it personally but it was like it was sort of an open world racing game sort of like what need for speed was trying to be around those days and uh this got rid of a lot of it. This is, this is like extremely bare bones. This is one of the skips. See if I remember how to do this. Yep. This is one of the skips. Yep. So normally if you're playing the New York hypercar race, you'd go on the interchange up top there and, uh, you know, go around normally, but that takes a while. So the speed run skip is to just go in the oncoming lane uh, off ramp as I just did right there. There's also a longer skip that involves going through the dirt, going through like the dirt up there where I'm currently facing, but uh, I don't prefer to do that because, you know, driving through the forest is tough. <laughs> but yeah. I'm just mad. I'm just mad. I'm just... I've got all this distaste for this Ubisoft stuff. I genuinely feel like EA used to be... Nope. Hold on. I genuinely feel like EA used to be the worst gaming company. But now Ubisoft is really, really pushing it for that title. They're really freaking pushing it. Things that happen with the Crew 1 is, like, terrible. And I don't have the Crew 1, but I'm still mad. Imagine getting a thing. Imagine buying anything, really. But, like, a game included, obviously. And then one day the company just says, Nope, license is revoked. Game is gone. Uh, not anymore. You can't play this. Nope. It's frick you. <laughs> and I'm just mad. And Driver San Francisco as well. Driver San Francisco is a great game that I never really played on my channel. But uh, I should. Never really played it on my channel, but uh, I should. And that is one of the best games that you can't play because the licensing for it ran out, so they took it down from all digital stores. So you would have to spend like $300 to get a key that someone's miraculously haven't used in the past 15 years. 15 years? And that makes me mad as well. That makes me upset because the driver, driver San Francisco is a good game. But it's also a Ubisoft game. So, well, what are you going to do? And it just feels like when license, when getting... I am <laughs> one of those videos. I might make it to San Francisco and not even be done talking and have to figure out where else to go. Yeah, this is, uh... I'm just mad at Ubisoft. Every single Ubisoft game is, like, the peak... Every single recent Ubisoft game is, like... And this game came out in 2018, by the way. It's, like, the single most defining paramount example of the corporate slop game that has been put out for the past, like, ten years or so. The skip for here is to just skim through those trees rather than turn around manually. I'm usually way too chicken to do that fast, as you saw. I could do it fast, but then I would likely hit one of the trees. <laughs> but it's just... Just, what are you gonna do? Like, I, every Ubisoft game is, like, just a pinnacle example. That was the word that was escaping me. Pinnacle example of the garbage corporate slop. 
that's been putting a, that's been put out nowadays. Watch Dogs 2 comes out, its story is soulless, it has no inspiration, it's not inspiring. It's uninspired, that's the word I'm thinking of. It has no art, no real, like, art direction, it has no real direction throughout it. It's just, uh, oh, it's the hack of the planet! <laughs> and you're freaking the hack of the planet, and you got, like, you know, drive a car around the streets of San Francisco, blasting Turbo Lover while being chased by the police. And you get no feeling. It's probably, it's like a fun minigame. Feels like a side mission, that mission. Really feels like a side mission. Yep, Watch Dogs 2 comes out. And the worst part is it feels like the world around, it feels like Watch Dogs 2 is the clash of both. I think that's why Watch Dogs 2 is like the big focus of Mega Rant. Because Watch Dogs 2 feels like the clash of both ideologies. Because, broke up the recording. Because the world of Watch Dogs 2 is kind of decently okay-ish. It seems like it has thought put into it. But then the characters, the main characters and the main faction you play for, they don't. So it's like the clash of the new soulless corporate slop versus the old, you know, putting effort into your universe. This is another one of those skips I didn't do it right. I think I did it too early. Yeah, you're usually supposed to do that a little earlier. It, it saves, uh, that's something I do personally, it's not something I find out about because it saves, uh, I have a boost, right? Yep. <laughs> it saves having to take the 90 degree turns and you do not want to do 90 degree turns because those suck. You do want to do jumps though, those are fun. Let's boost off this jump too. Wait a minute. That was weird. That was weird, I, bo I held shift and then it stopped the boosting for a second. I don't know. I'm just disappointed because... I really wanted to like Watch Dogs 2. I tried my best to like it, and I just don't. I just don't. Here's another skip, by the way. You duck through here. You can maintain a whole lot of speed without losing it. And come on straight through here, and then down over to here. A little bit better than going through all those windy, crappy roads. Yeah, just, I wanted to like Watch Dogs 2. I really did. But it's... The ability, that was my steam, the ability to, to the ability to mod it is essentially locked down hard. It's locked down really hard, the ability to mod it. Some of the systems are really just harsh in some ways. There was always this sense that the world was rejecting you, and I guess that was the point you wanted. To, they wanted to make you feel powerful, they wanted to make you feel like, oh, if someone rejects you, just hack their phone and then laugh at them as their phone explodes in their face or something, I don't know. But you know what I mean? There was, if that's, not like a, that's like a slapstick thing, that's not... That's, there's no depth to that. It's like a slapstick thing. You know what I mean? Because, you know, if you're playing a game and someone, like an NPC, treats you wrong and you want to laugh at them as you do something, as you exercise your power as the player of a video game to them, like you shoot them in the tank with a face if they say your hair looks funny. It's just, there's this sense of the game itself wants you to do that because there's this sense of... There's this sense that it treats the player like someone who doesn't have a standard higher than that. That's the- oop, that was a little close. That's the feeling I get. Welcome to St. Louis, Missouri, by the way. This is a rather small map. Takes about, uh, takes about a half hour to drive between. At least that's how fast I can drive between it. Here's another skip, by the way. Saves the right- saves the right angle turn at the end of this. You can hit that a lot easier there. Without a lot of, uh, speed loss. Yep, can you tell I got that race down to a science? Before. <laughs> It's because it was a really fun race. I really like the point-to-point uh, -point races in games, and I also really like the long point-to-point -point races. That's probably because I'm a big Excel Racers fan, because the point-to-point -point races in Excel Racers are just that, point-to-point, -point, but they also take like a full hour a lot of the time. Oop, there was the time Taro finished the Water Realm in 20 minutes, though. So that was pretty legendary of him. But uh, yeah, enough about that. I just really wanted to like Watch Dogs 2 because this is like... There's such this sense of so this this sense of disrespect. Let's go with that. There's this sense that I'm being treated as a statistic, as an average, as a corporate idea of what a player is. And I'm not that. Thank you, Lag Spike, for making me hit that truck. There's this sense that when I play these games, I'm no longer being treated as a guest in their world, almost. I'm no longer being treated as I'm not being welcomed anymore. I feel like I'm I'm given a mask. I'm given a costume, and I'm told this is your part in our theatrical play, almost. You know what I mean? It's a really weird feeling. Like, you know, a lot of other games, whoop, a lot of other games, you would essentially, 
play the part of what you want to do, but you would the, the game would sit would take itself seriously. You'd be the guest in the world. You can alter it to the way you desire. If you play an RPG like Mass Effect, it's kind of a bad example. Mass Effect's ending is very linear. People are still mad about that to this day. <laughs> but if you play a game that has like multiple endings and multiple branching paths, based on what you do as a player, that's the sort of thing. The sort of thing of like you're a guest in the game. And that's why I included the clip of Spec Ops The Line, where it literally credits the player's Steam username as Special Guest, which is a legendary little design touch. The game's chugging along. I broke up the recording, stopped it chugging along, it started again. Well, thank you very much. There's this sense of, like, when you play a video game that has its own world and its own story, it's like you're the guest walking into a completed place. Like a tourist, almost. But not even a tourist, you're a tourist who can affect the world can affect the world around you, you know what I mean? Even if the missions are linear and there's like a set story, you're still, you're the one that's doing it. There's the sense that you're the one that's doing it and you get to choose how you do it, you get to choose the ways to do it, you get to choose to be there and do it. Like, if you play Mass Effect, there are a lot of things you can change. Like, the ending is ultimately kind of sort of the same. It's kind of sort of the same three endings, but with variations. And, uh, there are some things in the in it you can change though, you can change how strong or weak certain factions are, you can change which characters live or die, you can change which ones you romance, as an example. But there's this sense that you are the welcome, honored guest to this world, and you can affect it, and you and the game build a sort of a relationship of mutual respect in that sense. The game respects you as the player, respects that you may want to do things a little differently or do things your way and you respect the game for being its own established world and universe and lore that you have uh, joined in because you're interested and you want to get into it. Like, if you play Mass Effect, you play it for, Ma for Mass Effect. You don't play it for the slapstick. Uh, can I beat this bus? Yep. Can I beat that car? Yep. Oh, Ground Drift. Nice, I got a Ground Drift record there. There's another, uh... That blinking, by the way, that's indicating that there's like a pack of uh, parts somewhere that I can go find. But uh, that's just more freemium nonsense that's designed to tickle my brain, tickle them to uh, really activate my neurons, and I will not have it. <laughs> Even look at all these numbers on the screen going up. You ever heard the number go up thing? Those are all just, those are all freaking designed to make my neurons activate, and I'm just not having any of it. I'm here for the drive and nothing else. It is long since past the time I cared about this game. I'm only here because it's the Crew 1 sequel. So, I need another, another drink of water. But, yeah, the thing I was, uh, saying. Mm. Some good water. The thing I was saying, uh... I don't know, there's this sense... The thing with Watch Dogs, all these games, there's this sense of... There's this sense that the game believes you are a certain way. That's a good way of putting it. Before, in games, there was always this sense, this mutual relationship of respect. Every game had that. That's something that I was touching on and trying to describe back in the Mega Rant, but didn't really put it into these words until now. When you play games, there's this sense of mutual respect. A relationship of mutual respect. There used to be a big gate here, right? Oh, no, the gate is back there. Isn't the gate... Yeah, I think the gate is back there, but I skip it now, so I forget that it's there already. All the time, I mean. Wow, the camera auto-centering is so bad! There it is. That's the delay of the auto center, by the way. If I jerk the mouse and then let go of the mouse, while moving, that's the delay. That's the auto center delay. It is bad. It is really bad. <laughs> it's terrible. But yeah, there's this. When you play games, there's this sense of mutual trust and respect. There's this sense of uh, whatever you want to do in the game. You've been given this set of tools. You've been given this set of rules in terms of game mechanics. And, uh, you know, you know, basic things like your gun has limited ammo, uh, you have a certain amount of health. And, uh, you know, here's your gun. In the case of, like, Just Cause, which I'm thinking of, here's your grappling hook, that's a tool. Here's your infinite C4 from Just Cause 3, that's another tool. Here's your rules of, like, you know, you have, you have three guns, one primary, one special, and one secondary. You have the grappling hook, it can only be used in this range. There's this sense of, like... These games have the- a lot of games have this sense of respecting the player and then you respect the game back. There's this mutual sense of- there's this mutual relationship sense of, like, respect. I've said that like six times now. But the sense that you get from that is the sense that, you know, in exchange for 
the, you, the player, are suspending your disbelief and adhering to some of these rules, which, by the way, can be bent and broken with the use of, like, mods and glitches and exploits. Uh, there's the sense of, in exchange for following those rules and being interested, in exchange for following those rules, in exchange for uh, suspending your disbelief, in exchange for visiting the world of the game and visiting the product that these companies have created with care. The exchange is that the game will allow you to affect the world in your own unique way and do whatever you want in it. The thing with Just Cause, like, you are given a gun in Just Cause, and you are given the rule of you are in an oppressive country with a bunch of military bases that you can go blow up, and essentially there is now this mutual pact of respect between the player who understands, okay, I only have three guns and a grappling hook and some bombs, and the world is an oppressive dictatorship, and the game says back, all right, you know, those are, the, those are essentially the basic rules, but beyond that, you can have fun in any way you want. If you don't want to use the gun, you want to use just the grappling hook, that's just fine. We even included an achievement to encourage doing that at least once, just to try it. If you want to use only the bombs, you can also do that. If you want to use just the guns, that's fine too. If you want to use vehicles, we have vehicles too. There's this sense of like, but there's this sense of not infringing on who the player is as well. Because like, a player might want to do all those things, and the game says, yes, sure, you can do all those things. But the player still understands that, like, you're not going to rob a bank in, a, in Just Cause, because Just Cause isn't a game about robbing banks. It doesn't have bank robberies as a mechanic. And in exchange for, like, no, you can't rob a bank, there's the exchange of, but you can do all of this within the scope of the game, essentially. You know, in this game... In this game, I can't, you know, run a marathon, or hunt deer, or, you know, fight terrorists in the Middle East or anything, because this is a racing game. But, uh... <laughs> Generally, there is this sort of sense. Oh, this is a speed trap up here, I think. Or is it an escape? I do not want to do an escape. No. Don't really feel like doing an escape. Okay, it's just a speed trap. Can I make it? Nah, probably not. I so doubt because I was worried it was an escape, but I don't want to do it. Nope. Oh, well. Don't care. Don't care. Can you imagine if I cared? But yeah, games do that, and then there's this sense of mutual respect. I was driving for a while, I broke up the recording. There's the sense of respect that as long as you adhere within limits to, like, what the game... the game's vision, the game's world, then you can also enter it and affect it and become the guest and shape it in your way. In my case, you know, if I play an open world game, something I might want to do as an example. This is another one of those skips, by the way. I completely missed the boost button. That's fine. Uh, let's see if I hit a tree. There's one right there. Okay. Not the worst that skip's ever gone. Not the best. Obviously, there's like a big on-ramp. Obviously, there's like a big on-ramp back there. You're supposed to drive all the way around and down here if you were playing the cross-country race. But you can just do that. Saves a lot of time even if you hit a tree. <laughs> so... But yeah, there's this sense of mutual respect. Like, games with garage mechanics... Garage mechanics are a pretty good example. I talked about that in the Humanized Security Car uh, rant video. Games with garages are a pretty good example. Because, like, here's this world. It's an open world full of vehicles. And you have the freedom to go drive for whatever you want. And uh, as an added bonus, something of the game respecting the player's will and... Uh, respecting the player's will and desires and the potential for them to have wildly different desires, respecting the versatility, the variability of the player base. Here is a garage so that you can take any vehicle that you find, and if you want it badly enough, you can save it for later use. Or maybe you're just, or maybe you're like me and you don't necessarily want it to use it, you just want it because you want to like collect that vehicle and just have it. Then it's pleasant <laughs> to have that. There's these senses of these games. It's it's good to have that. There's this sense of mutual respect. There's this sense that the game understands that there are very many thousands and millions of different people that are going to play the game. And uh, in exchange for all of those people suspending their, dis their, their disbelief and agreeing to play with the certain sets of rules put forth by the game inside the game's set of uh, lore rules, such as, like, you know... If you play Mass Effect, you know, the rule is like, it's in space, you have a spaceship, you talk to people, that's sort of the game, you know what I mean? Things like game mechanics, world mechanics, you know, if you play Command & Conquer, generally the rule is that there's going to be a lot of fighting, there's no diplomacy, I guess. I don't know, if you play uh, a lot of things, you generally, you genuinely understand 
that, you know, the game is only going to provide you so much, and in exchange for suspending your disbelief and agreeing to that limited scope of the game, to that limited scope of, dis of distilled, crafted, well thought out, passionate, put together, you know, gaming experience, in exchange for that, I think I missed this, kinda, no, that was fine, that was fine, in exchange for all of that, the game understands that you, I'm gonna hit this speed trap, the game understands that you are going to play the game very differently than the other average people around, and uh, the game gives you freedoms while taking some away, that's the point of the game, and generally at the end there's just this sense of, there's a sense of respect, there's a sense of, you respect the game, you know. I understand that I'm not going to have to be looking up to stave off any gunships that are going to, going to attack me because this is a racing game. I understand that if I come here looking for, you know, a grand battle, a grand battle for the ages, I'm not going to get it. I'm just here to drive. Then in exchange for that, the game should respect me by giving me such things as allowing me to drive the different cars I want, etc. Having a free drive as an example is also a good amount of respect. Having a free drive at all for me to be able to do this and not just live in the races. Another good thing. But the point I was building towards as I talked for like 10 freaking straight minutes was, uh... There's this sense with all these games, all the games of the past, that they understand this mutual relationship of respect and they will give you a lot of fun in exchange for a little bit of your freedoms and a little bit of your expectations and a little bit of your obedience in a way and uh, and then in, in exchange they will also give you things like the freedom to you know take whatever vehicle you want with the garage system in the game or you know in the case of like command and conquer I guess the ability to capture enemy buildings which is cool or the ability to in other RTS games that don't have that the ability to I guess command your forces the way you want there's just this sense of... And there's this sense of also not knowing what the player is going to do. There's this other thing. There's this sense of the intended path. There's this sense of the unintended path as well. And that's generally the most what happens with a lot of very good games. In Command & Conquer, there's about 70 different ways to finish every single mission. The game does not stop you from finishing them in certain ways. The game will not penalize you for trying to do them in certain ways. Aside from obviously, you know, like if you're trying to attack an anti-infantry turret with a bunch of infantry, you're probably going to lose a couple of, in of infantry in the process. But generally, the game will allow you to do that. That's kind of what I say a lot. That was some major popping right there. That's kind of what I say a lot about games in general. The more they allow you to do what you want, the better they are. That's really what games are to me. They're very freeing. They're very freedom-based. If I want to play Command and Conquer right now and I want to use only ships then I will have a new set of challenges based on only ships, but I'm not going to get, like, a, a screen that says you're not allowed to only build ships, you know, build tanks. <laughs> and there's this mutual respect and understanding with all these games that if I do what I want, that I am going to suspend my disbelief, play by your rules, but I also have these amount of tool, this amount of tools, this amount of rules, and within that I can... I can, uh overcome a challenge in my own way and fill in the bl fill in the blank fill in the rest to play the game and achieve it in my own way as in if you're playing just cause and you have a military base that you have to blow up the goal is to blow up the military base but the way you go about doing it is entirely up to you the player and there's this sense of respect when the game doesn't encourage you in any real way on how to do that it just says here's a base here's all your guns Here's all your graphic hooks. You know, these are what you have. These are the rules that we've created, we being Avalanche. And uh, here's a base for you to go blow up. You do the rest. The sense of mutual respect, the sense of being treated like a player almost. Like a part of the like a part of the game. I missed that turn clearly. Like a part of the game essentially. You are the fundamental end user of the game. And uh, ultimately anything the developers do, you know. They could spend so much time putting that gun in the game, and someone might decide, I don't want to use it today. And someone else might decide, I'm going to use only the gun today. But the fact that you're allowed to do both of those things, the game will not judge you, will not penalize you, will not uh, challenge you for it, will not fail you for doing that, is the respect I'm talking about. 
That's essentially the respect I'm talking about. The re you respect the game by saying, okay, I will blow up that base. And the game respects you by saying, I will allow you to do it, to do it in any way you want. And that mutual relationship of respect is something that is sorely missing from Ubisoft games. Which is the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate freaking point that I started talking about back in, like, freaking New York. Where is the road? Oh, I'm going per parallel to the road, you idiot. Hey, Rock. Hey, cameo appearance from Just Cause 1. Nice. <laughs> anyway. That's the mutual respect I'm talking about, pretty much. Because when I play Watch Dogs 2, I don't get that feeling. I get that feeling of, like... I get that really harsh feeling of... I'm not respected like that. Because... If you want to play Watch Dogs 2 in ways other than just, like, be a sneaky hacker, you can, technically, but the game's also really hard if you don't do that. You see, the thing in ju with Just Cause is that if you use your guns only without everything else, it's not hard. If you use your grappling hook only without the guns, it's also not hard. Those are all viable ways of playing the game. There isn't this sense of, like... There isn't this sense of, like, you know, if you don't shoot the enemies and use your gun, then the enemies will just kill you, so you have to use a gun. And Watch Dogs 2 is like the opposite of that. It's a little bit on the harder side if you do, don't do the hacking thing. You don't really have much of a, any other option in some ways in certain missions. And uh, there's this sense as well that there's this sense that Watch Dogs 2 infringes on my disrespects me. It infringes on my respect. It disres it disrespects me because there's this idea that it's it already knows what kind of player I'm going to be and has already built it towards that. There's this sense of railroading without railroading. It's kind of weird. And returning to the thing I mentioned about slapstick comedy. It feels like the world is so harsh because they expect the player to laugh at it and say, Oh, how dare you call me like a jerk? I'm going to hack your phone now. Or I'm going to punch you in the face. Or I'm going to make like the, the quad rotor like crash into you or something. And then I'm going to laugh and have a silly little, you know, five second moment of entertainment. And there's this sense of expecting the player to do that. Expecting all players to do that. Watch Dogs 2 is like a game built for one type of player. And that's why I feel very disrespected playing it almost. In some ways. Because, you know, sometimes I use a light machine gun in Watch Dogs 2. I use a light machine gun in Just Cause 3. Because my general sort of battle style in those sorts of games is that I am one person, one player who's probably going to get attacked by large forces of enemies, I'm going to need something that's capable of matching that situation. In in this case, a light machine gun, because it's good for fighting small armies. In Just Cause 3, it works well. In Just Cause... In Watch Dogs 2, it, uh, It's still pretty good, but obviously there's, like... There's almost this sense of the game is punishment for not playing the game that they wanted you to play. There's this weird sense in Watch Dogs 2 that's like that. Because... Broke up the record again. Because, like, in Watch... It feels like Watch Dogs 2 is a game about hacking. You have to hack and be stealthy. And if you fail at doing that, then you have to fight off a bunch of enemies. But it's, it's strangely balanced and designed in this way that it feels like fighting off the bunch of enemies isn't really, like part of the gameplay. It isn't fun. It isn't something that you would seek out doing because it's actually rather difficult and the guns aren't that good and the player isn't very good at isn't very survivable. So like even if you have like masterful perfect aim you're still gonna get killed very quickly because it's just there's just too many enemies. There's just too many enemies and they're just too and even if you do like a fighting retreat to try to lower the amount of damage you're taking you're still just gonna get killed because like the enemies are just too strong. They're just too strong. You can be as good as you want, and uh, they're just too strong. And there's this sense that Watch Dogs 2 is... Uh, it's a hacking game, it's a stealth game, but if you fail the hacking, you're punished by having to play... having to play like a normal open-world shootout game. And it's so weird. And there's... it's just... it's, it's weird. There's this sense that Watch Dogs 2 is only built for one type of player. And if you're on, if, and if you aren't that type of player, you don't mesh well with the game and it, you don't it just it's not very good. It doesn't work out too well. Like you've seen me play Just Cause 3, I'm sure you have. You've seen me play Just Cause 3, I'm just fine 
with like a one-man army with the with the, with the with the light machine gun. It's so good. You can freaking shoot down helicopters with that thing. It's so good. But you know, something else about that is you have the mobility of the grappling hook, and generally you also have the fact that the game is not insanely difficult either. But it's also fun. It's fun to do that. Heat Five in Just Cause Three is genuinely fun to do. Heat 5 in Watch Dogs 2 is not fun. Heat, Heat 5 in Watch Dogs 2 feels like a hazard and nuisance. It's like they were trying to go for this realistic sense of if the police are chasing you, you have to run away from them or you will just die because that's what it is in real life. There is not this suspension of disbelief where it says, okay, in exchange for you going to our world and playing by our set of rules and our, you know, set of world, such as the fact that this is a modern world, you will find no, you will find no jet bikes in it. Except you do. Not in Watch Dogs 2. What? Not in Watch Dogs 2 specifically, but yeah, there was that. But instead, there's this sense of, in exchange for doing all that, you know, the player is given the ability to, you know, rampage against an open world game's authorities and have fun doing that. Except no, because not even the freedom to do that is available. The game has not respected you enough to give you that freedom because the game has decided that. For our rule for today, the police are going to be something you have to outrun and get away from because they will just murder you if you don't. And, uh, it's, it's, I'm really disappointed. This entire video is just making me feel just disappointed. This, I just, I, I'm disappointed in Ubisoft. I'm disappointed with a lot of it. There's this complete torpedoing of this sort of mutual relationship of respect that video games establish with the player. You know, the game says, we're a modern world, so you aren't going to be fighting with swords. And the player says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have that. And the game says, you know, in exchange, here's these sets of different guns you can have. And, uh, you know, the player says, okay, that's good, mutual respect. But then Watch Dogs 2, and I've said it in many ways... Watch Dogs 2 does not respect the player. It does not respect the fact that players will do many different things in the world. Uh, players in the world will do many different things. It only respects the type of player that wants to do sneaky hacking. And it only respects the player that wants a casual, light-hearted, non-serious experience. And, you know, someone who's not going to take the game seriously. And that's like disrespecting my desire to have a game to take seriously that I can then screw around with. Because there's a golden rule with comedy and humor in general that the unexpected or the juxtaposed is often the foundation of very many jokes. Like, like if you shoot someone with a paintball gun, it's not funny if it's in a paintball arena because it's expected. If you shoot someone with a paintball gun in an open world game, it's funnier because it's not as expected. It doesn't fit as much. You know, you laugh because it doesn't fit there. It's out of place. Jokes are often built on things being out of place. And the thing is, though, that sort of underflows. That sort of underflows and reverses the effect of that. If you have a situation where a game is trying to be so out of place that suddenly the out of place is in place. <laughs> it's as Syndrome said in The Incredibles. Uh, if everyone's super, no one can be. Oh, no one will be. That's the point. There's this sense that, uh, you know, the game wants you to do the stupid things and do the slap someone in the face with, like, the 8-ball in Watch Dogs 2 or something. The game expects you to do that. The game expects you to play lighthearted and casually, so it's built around that. The game, you know, wants all that stuff. The game wants you to play in a certain way. There's, the dis there's this sense of disrespect. And then when you don't do that, the game, like, pushes back on you. Because, you know, you saw, you, you saw in the Watch Dogs 2 police series, like, if I change my player model to be a police officer and include a couple of mods to make it kind of sort of like I'm playing alongside the police, people will still run up to you and yell at you for being dead sec. It's like, it's weird. And it would have been a little more respectful to, I guess, not have that there, I suppose. I don't know. You know what I mean? You kind of, you get what I mean? Do you get what I mean? This sense of respect. Yeah. Kinda. Kinda, yeah, pretty much. And I'm just upset. I'm upset because that's how I feel Watch Dogs 2. Watch Dogs 2 is not designed very well for that. Watch Dogs 2 is a game where if everything is out of place, then nothing's out of place anymore and it's soulless and boring. Because the joke isn't funny anymore if you're being told jokes constantly, essentially. 
In Saints Row 2, for example, perfect example, when you like, when you like hit someone with a, with a katana, when you hit someone with a katana, it's funny because it's out of place in like a modern city of the United States. But it's funnier because that person is framed as not having expected it that day. No one's framed as having expected it because the world takes itself very seriously. The world around you takes it seriously. So when you do something funny and stupid and out of place, it makes it even better. It makes the experience better because it was not expected. But if you flip it around and have a game like, ironically, Saints Row 3, then anything stupid and funny you do, that's just like the same thing the game itself is doing. So it's not as funny or special anymore. You know what I mean? If you want to dress up in a hot dog suit in like Saints Row 2, then that's funny and out of place and hilarious because, you know, everyone is taking it seriously. And then in the later Saints Row games, if you want to dress up in a hot dog suit, it's still funny and a little out of place, but like I just said, it's a little out of place because everything else is so stupid now. And the same is true of Watch Dogs 2. Watch Dogs 2 is just Saints Row. Watch Dogs 2 is just like a Saints Row game, essentially. It's just a Saints Row game by a different company, pretty much. And I'm just, yeah. Hmm. That's essentially what I'm getting at. It's not very respectful. Not very respectful of me as a player. Not very respectful of players in general because it feels like it's catered towards one specific type of person. If you are not that type of person, then you're gonna have a bad time playing it. As I did. Hi, truck. Hello, San Francisco. And we have made it to San Francisco. And by the way, if I was on the cross-country race, the finish line was on the middle of the bridge, so I'm done. And yeah. Thank you for follow up. I don't care. So yeah, there's this sense of just... I don't know. Oh, it's starting to rain. <laughs> That's kind of perfect, actually. It's starting to sun shower a little bit. Man, it'd be cool if I didn't have the freaking camera auto-centering. Yikes. Yeah, this is just... I'm mad at Ubisoft. And I know I was talking about nothing but Watch Dogs 2 this whole time, but I should also talk about the other games for a little bit. Now that I'm in San Francisco, I broke up recording yet. I should talk about the other games a little bit. All that stuff is true of uh, Watch Dogs 2. All that stuff about the lack of respect. That stuff is also kind of true of this game. Because this game doesn't really respect you. I don't really think. A couple of ways in a little bit. A couple of ways a little bit. But generally, not really. There's these little things that makes it feel very immensely disrespectful. Like... I'm trying to think of one. I'm trying to think of one as an example. Like, I think I remember there was something, and I'm trying to remember what it was. That's weird, I'm not sure. That's weird, I'm trying to... There's, I feel like there's a specific thing somewhere that I'm trying to remember what it was, but I can't remember what it was. Well, there is one big thing. There is one big thing that I can think of that's immensely disrespectful. I don't know if it's the thing I'm thinking of, but there is one thing that's immensely disrespectful. So, let's find a place to park up. Sure, let's find a let's park up next to this place called Hotel. What kind of a hotel has that few floors? <laughs> what kind of a hotel? Wait a minute. What kind of a hotel doesn't even have, like, the front door in front of the sign that says hotel? Like, oh my god. Remember earlier when I said... Yeah. 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 As the front door to a jewelry store just in this back alley. Yep, that's a great recipe for disaster. This is something I meant when I said that Ubisoft games feel randomly generated. San Francisco in uh, Watch Dogs 2 was okay for a map design. This one is not. Like, look at this. This this building does not have a front door. That bench is floating. This building does not have a front door. All these cars look the same. They're very low, uh... Low quality. The scenery is kind of low quality. I didn't know there's a ship out there. Hmm. Yeah, it's just... This really feels like. And it's not just because the graphics are really low as well. There really is this sense of, uh... There's this sense of AI generation to these Ubisoft games. There's this sense of AI corporate generation, you know, what is the average player going to want or think or do, and then it caters to that person specifically. And then, you know, what can we skim on when it comes to quality? 
And then there's things like, look at that guy's pants. <laughs> jeez. Jeez. And like... Yeah, Watch, Watch Dogs 2, yeah. Watch Dogs 2 had that problem in a lot of ways. Like, the fact that they removed the garage system as well. I obviously talk about that a lot. The fact that they removed the garage system from games. That's an immense show of disrespect. The fact that they allow you to buy kinds of different kinds of things in Watch Dogs 2, but they don't even give you the certain version. The fact... Oh my god. And I think I said this in a YouTube comment to Adar. Not to, uh... Not to YouTube itself in general. So, uh... Something that happened with Ubisoft as well was that in Watch Dogs 2, there's a mission where the Chicago police vessel from Watch Dogs 1 makes a cameo appearance. You aren't respected, though, for that, because if you if you were respected as a player, as the end user, as the final person being given this experience, you would probably have the option to save it or have it in some way beyond just drive it once and you're done. Or maybe not even drive it. Maybe it'll just be a prop or something. I like how the idle camera's going. There's this sense of that. There's this sense that if the game respected you, it would have given you a way to be able to drive that whenever you want, so long as you put in the effort to get it, like brought it to a garage. That was kind of like, in older games, that was sort of the mutually respectful relationship I'm talking about. You know, the game says, here's a garage system, we respect your right to, uh... We respect your right to get any kind of vehicle you want and then save it, and in return, you respect the fact that you will have to put work into doing that. <laughs> so... You know, the game, in exchange for making it possible to respect the player's desire to do that, is uh, respected by the player's will of saying, okay, you know, how much work will that take? How much effort do I need to put into? That's okay. I will, res I will respect the fact that I, need to, that I need to do that as well. Hmm. And that loss of respect is something that I've been talking about. Do you like how the car on the left was above the white bar on the top? Oh, I guess that's kind of, I guess that's supposed to be a thing. Alright, I guess it's supposed to be like a 3D effect. Yeah, there's this sense of that. It's, it's just bad. And yeah, too much about Watch Dogs, but Watch Dogs is ex extremely soulless and on its own. But it, it's horrible because it seems, I really like the city of San Francisco, as I mentioned. It's my favorite city in the United States because it's where Euro's Revenge starts, so it's Command and Conquer bias. And, uh... <laughs> I really wanted to like Watch Dogs 2 because it's an open world game in San Francisco, in San Francisco, and I just couldn't. It's too much Ubisoft corporate slop. But enough about that, that game. Let's talk about this game. You obviously have uh, the story I was going to talk about that I forgot, and this is why I parked up. Was that? Let's see. If I go to profile and I go to V, why does it say pilot? What's this? I don't freaking care about any of that. Get out of here. If you go over here. I'm a big fan. When it comes to cars, I really like Koenigsegg. I think Koenigsegg cars are very aesthetically pleasing. I think Lamborghini and Bugatti are very overrated. And, uh... Oh, is that a... Oh, I think that's an icon that tells you what bonus you have on the car. That's nice. That's cool. Like this one, I have the double nitrous bonus. This does neat. This is the Yesco. Look at the amount of nitrous I have on the bottom left. Because the answer is a lot. This car is extremely fast. This car is the this car is the car that made me lose friendships. This is a, this is a joke. And also, you know, you have the red star of the Soviet Union and the blue star of a different country from uh, actually a fantasy universe that I made up. Fun fact: I made up a fantasy universe. Anyway, comes another player. Ooh, they're uh, there are. That means they're brand new to the game. Shout out to them. Shout out to them driving past. Have fun, honk honk. Ooh, they might be turning around and have a look at me. Nice. Anyway. Oh, they're honking at me. Oh, I forgot what the honk button is. I found the, I found the siren button. There, I honked at them. There, I honked at them. Anyway, yeah, so the thing I was mentioning was that uh, if I go into catalog here, shout out to this random player who just came up to me. Uh, if we go to the catalog, I really like Koenigsegg. You will notice up there it says 8 out of 9. Well, so first we have the Agera R, the classic, the one that was, well, the CCR was, uh, or the CCX, I believe, was in Saints Row 2. This one is the 2012, uh, this is the 2012 extension evolution of that. Here's the Agera R drift version, it's a different class of vehicle entirely. This is the touring car version, this is if you would do, like, the professional racing 
Ah, yeah, here's the CCR. This is the one that's in Saints. This is the one that's in Saints Row 2. As the, uh, the Bazir, yes. And then you have this one, the Koenigsegg Gemera, which I also have. You have the Koenigsegg Yesko. This is the 1-1 as well. It looks a lot, a lot like the Agar R, but that's because it's a little different. I believe it has a power to, rate, to weight ratio of 1 to 1, which is like, I don't know a lot about cars enough to know how significant that is, but I do know that they know that it's very significant because apparently that was thought to be impossible, but they made a car that has it. So well done to Koenigsegg. And then here's the 2015 Regera. You'll notice this one is... Well! <laughs> oh my god. Okay, you know what? Credit where credit's due. Alright, the crew too. Alright, okay. Credit where credit's due. Okay. So what I was going to say was I have 8 out of 9 of the cars. Of the Koenigseggs. Because this one is the regular Jamera. And this one is a special Jamera that was only available in, like, a certain, you know, player tournament. So, naturally, only the hackers get it. And uh, if you don't win it in that tournament, or if you don't get it in, like... Hang on, there's a Bugatti that's like that. There's, like, a famous Bugatti variant that's like that. Let me see if I'm still there for that. Where's the Bugatti? Here we go. Uh, this one's the Carbon Edition. Where's the one that... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, this is the what I'm talking... Yeah, what I mean. The Bugatti Devo Magma Edition, considered to be the best car in the game, the best version of the best car in the game. You have to play a live summit, that's essentially the player tournament, which means naturally only the hackers will ever be able to drive this car. But there was another one where this thing, where this game has like a motor pass sort of a thing, where it's like a, uh, what's it called? Battle pass system? Where you have to complete a certain amount of tasks in a certain amount of time or something like that. And you have to have enough of the like crew credits up here. Which is the premium microtransaction currency. In order to get the special variants of vehicles like this. And then if you missed it, it was gone forever. You will never be able to ever get it. And uh, I participated in the one to get this car. Because I really like Koenigsegg. And I wanted to have two different versions of the Jamera. And... Uh, and then it turned out I didn't have enough of the crew credits to get it. And what ended up happening was that I couldn't get it. And that would sit at 8 out of 9 forever. And I got really upset. I got really mad because it turned out that I could have gotten it if I wanted to fork over 5 bucks. 5 bucks of real money. And I said, frick that. I'm not going to get roped into this. And I did not spend the $5. And thankfully, I made the correct decision. <laughs> because... Apparently, they must have changed that, so now you can just buy them all. So I'm going to go buy this one to complete my Koenigsegg set. So yeah, the addition of a, cus of a custom track, of a custom track creator, that is a good, that you saw at the beginning of the video, that is pretty good. Credit where credit's due. And the ability to buy these now without having to win them from the motor passes, uh, also good. Also credit where credit's due. Shout out to that. Uh, this game overall still, though. Everything that's happened. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got 2.5 million. Sure. Get window tinge to protect your privacy. Nice. Nice. All right. Press B to hit drive. I got the Jamera. The Jamera Outclass Edition. This is a very nice car, by the way. A little random side tangent about cars in general. Uh, Christian von Koenigsegg is freaking insane. He said, what if we make a million dollar supercar, but we also make it family friendly by having four seats? You will notice there are four seats in here. Uh, it's technically a coupe, I believe, because it's only one door, but the door uh, opens across both seats, so you can still get in very comfortably. And it's just, it's very unheard of. And it's its cool, I like Koenigsegg. That's why I'm a fan of Koenigsegg. I like... Uh, I like Koenigsegg for really pushing the limits of what cars can do and also having really cool looking, aesthetically pleasing vehicles, unlike Lamborghini. In my well, I mean, I was just driving the Egoista for the most of the video, but like, things like the Gallardo, I've always struck me as, as like, generic before. But either way, with all that, ooh, let's, yeah, we're in Los Angeles because the street race uh, he headquarters is in Los Angeles, so let's drive back to San Francisco here in the Outclass Edition. But yeah, the story I was gonna say, whoop. The story I was going to mention was that whole thing of disrespect was, uh, I was going to say that this game has certain variants of vehicles that you can only get through, like, the motor passes. And if you miss them, 
then you can no longer get them, they're gone forever. But it looks like they changed that. So credit where credit is due, they did fix that. So shout out to that, they did fix that. So yeah, that is that is pretty good. Even even still though, there is there is there is this I don't know. I just I just I don't know. There's also obviously the fact that you can't play the crew one anymore. Where That's, it is, there's some exciting new stuff thank waiting you so for us much. back at HQ. I really don't care. We haven't been there in like. Can you imagine forever. if I cared? We should check it out. Don't care. <laughs> stuff's all still. Do not. Anyway. Yep, it's another one of those things. You know, maybe I will pick up this one just so you see what it's like. And maybe this outclass edition of the Jamera has cosmetics that I might care about. Even though I'm probably not going to play this game ever again after this. But then again, that is what I thought the last time. And now here I am driving the outclass edition. So, I mean, you know, how times change, I guess. Where is it? It's in that direction, you can tell, because it's, it's like, oh, is that it right there? Did I just spot it right there? No, that's a leaf. Apparently, nope. There it is, it's up there. Ooh, it's a gold one. It's the best tier of it. It's a gold one. Excuse me. Pardon me. All right, here we go. Live reward. Crates of just stuff. Those are performance parts. Those uh, those upgrade how the car handles. Let me go check that. Just for fun. Why not? Because this is probably all stock. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I got max rank stuff. Uh, generally, honestly, now that you're at the end of the game... The ones that aren't yellow, you don't even really want to bother with. <laughs> I mean, sometimes. Sometimes if you want something to be stock, you can get it to be like all blue. Because uh, the way it works is that blue... Does it work? I think the way it works is that like blue is the lowest tier. It has no additional effects. Green is the second be second better. Uh, you have one effect. Purple is the second to best. It has two effects. And then yellow is the best. It has two effects plus a... Uh, Plus a plus a uh, set bonus. So if I equip ev all seven performance parts with the same icon, it will give me an extra bonus. Like this one has nitro chemist to it. Is there a way? Okay, great news. I broke up the uh, I broke up the recording, but I guess I didn't press the start recording again button hard enough. Uh, you didn't really miss too much. <laughs> I'll just teleport back to where I. Uh... Oh, oh hey. Oh, look at that. It's a picture I took once. Nice. I'll just teleport back to where I was in Los Angeles. It'll be like it never happened. And uh, as I was saying, as I checked where I broke up the recording, uh, this stuff in here, uh, if I press an F9, oh, that's what it was, freaking idiot. Hey, guess what? Pressing F9 is actually the button to open this screen, but it's also the button to start and stop recording. So that's what happened, okay. Right, I see now. But yeah, uh, uh, blue has no effects. Green has one of the one of two effects. Purple has both effects, and then yellow has two, but also this, which if you have all seven of the same set, you get this extra bonus, which is also usually very good. Like I have nitro chemist on most of my cars, which is double nitrous. What the frick is this thing? What the frick is this thing? That looks cool. Huh? I didn't even realize I had that thing. Anyway, as I was uh, as I was saying. Or I was so rudely interrupted by the fact that the game broke. Or I, more accurately, I pressed the button. I didn't realize I was pressing the button to stop recording like that, like an idiot. Is that, uh... Alright. So, previously, one of the biggest things I was going to get around to complaining about in this game was the fact that it used to have this big FOMO motor pass thing of, uh... Here's this special car, and if you don't get it now, and if you don't pay money for it now, if you don't have the usual money for it, then it's gone forever, you lost it, you can't ever get it. But it looks like they changed that, and uh, it looks like they changed that and got rid of that. So, you know what? That's pretty cool. I'll take that. Credit where credit's due. Nice work, Ubisoft. You got rid of something that was stupid and terrible. Well done. Thank you very much for that. I'm now, my set of all nine Koenigseggs are now complete. So, thank you very much for that. There's also the thing about apparently being able to make your own races, which I found out when I, uh, press B. Something weird about this game. If you want to quit the game, you have to press B, because that's where the quit game button is, and that's where I found the create race button, which I think is personally very cool. Maybe I should try creating a race, honestly, just for fun. You know what I mean? Someone, that's what, that's a perfect example of what I, of what I mean by, per, by mutual respect. Somewhere, the developers 
for the for the fun and enjoyment and entertainment of the players and for their freedom and ability to create and express themselves in different ways they created a uh, mechanic that allows you to create your own races I feel respected by that so I should so I feel like I wouldn't mind respecting them back by creating one by just seeing what it's like just fiddling around with it for a little bit I am pleasantly surprised there I did get on this video, it's very ironic, I did get on this video to yell about Ubisoft and talk about how much I hate some of the stuff they're doing. But, once again, credit where credit's due, I'm pleasantly surprised that they implemented a couple of these really nice features in this game. But do not let any of that distract you from the fact that in five years we might not be able to play this game at all. Like, uh, hang on, I have to sneeze, I believe. Uh, maybe I lost it. Maybe it's still it's still there. I still feel it there. Come on No, it's the worst feeling. No, it's the worst feel. It's gone It's gone. <laughs> it's it's gone like the crew too will be in like two years mm. Still got my water that I've been drinking this whole time So yes Do not let all of that positive good distract you from the fact That you might not be able to play this game in maybe five years or so. Then maybe they'll just shut it down. And, you know, shutting it down is a thing that they can do, but they'll also, it's also online, so they you won't be able to play it anymore. And not only that, maybe they'll just revoke the licenses like they did with the Crew 1. Because the thing with the Crew 1 was that it was discovered in the game files that there was going to be some kind of an offline mode, but it's set to, like, hidden so you can't access it or something. But... They shut it down. They axed it completely. They destroyed it. They removed it from existence. They purged it. Because the thing with other games that... The thing with other games that get taken down like this is that they're either multiplayer, so it makes sense, but the crew one didn't have to be. And neither does this one, technically. It can technically be a single-player game. And, uh... And... Sorry. The, thi the thing is... Usually when games get shut down and they're shut down completely, you can never play them again. It's because, like, they're multiplayer and, uh, you know, obviously you can't play the game. It's not multiplayer. Come on. Got it. No, wait. Right, please. Right side, please. Not behind the barrier. That's okay. I wanted to avoid that escape. It's an activity I don't wish to do right now. So, yeah, if that happens, it's multiplayer. Or if it gets shut down, if it's like a single-player game, like Driver San Francisco is actually a big, perfect example. Another game in San Francisco by Ubisoft, published by Ubisoft that I actually like, believe it or not. Uh, something about that is that the thing is with that is that even though that got shut down, it didn't get shut down. Even though that got it got pulled from stores, you can no longer buy it or purchase it unless you want to fork over like two hundred dollars for a key that someone's miraculously never used, or track down like a physical copy that hasn't been used, or maybe find a console version I know it's uh, I know it's the keys I know it's the key system for PC I don't know if the con I don't know if the console ones just work if you put in the disc or something but either way if you want to buy that now you can't but if you had it already and I had the good fortune of having it already if you have it already then you're all set it still works it will still allow you to play it you can still install it you can still play it offline as well that's something very important Watch Dogs 2 if you're trying to play it online, if you're trying to play it in single player alone by yourself and your internet connection breaks, the game will crash. It needs to be online even though it's single player, which is also pretty disgusting. But Driver San Francisco can be played offline. And I know because I have a computer that doesn't have internet connection that used to and has Driver San Francisco installed on it. And it works and I can play it on that computer with no internet, <laughs> which is very nice. That's how games used to be. And... Uh, but this game, The Crew 2, one of the reasons I don't really try to invest time in it is obviously because there's a lot of it that's just, it's an okay racing game, it's an okay driving game, there's a lot of it that's not very high effort, or high quality. Not, a, lot, not, a lot of my friends don't really play it that much. And, uh, pardon me. They don't really play it that much, and, uh, a lot of different reasons. But one of the main reasons is obviously because of the Ubisoft curse, the Ubisoft garbage. You know, it's kind of, it would be kind of fun for me to be casual with, but if I wanted to put effort into it, I'd probably grind that New York hypercar race because you can make like 300 grand off of it each, each time. So if you want to get a car that's like $3 million, you have to do that race like 10 times. So that's not fun. 
that's not necessarily, that's not necessarily fun, but thankfully I have everything I already want for this. But generally, yeah, it's also that sort of stuff. There's a lot of, there's some microtransaction transaction stuff in this game. A lot of it's cosmetic, I'll give them that, I guess. There was obviously the whole FOMO thing that they used to have. This game's also kind of ever-changing a lot. Like, obviously, you know, there used to be you couldn't get this car that I'm currently driving unless you completed the one motor pass that it was available in. And if you missed it, it was gone forever, but apparently they changed that. There's just... yeah. There's, you know. <laughs> so, they, so they did change that. That's good. But obviously, there's that, and also the fact that this is Ubisoft. It's a modern Ubisoft game. So it feels very samey, very copy-pasted, sort of very AI-driven compared to a lot of other games. I think there's a speed trap right here. Sure, I'll go ahead and hit the speed trap. Why not? Nice. Yeah. Just, I don't know. You know? Hmm. It really is the sense that these games are starting to be like AI-driven. I mentioned the thing about how Watch Dogs 2 feels like it's catered towards one type of player. And, uh... It feels like this game is very generic. It feels like this game doesn't know people are playing it. There's this sense that it was just created as a cash grab, in a way, honestly. It feels like there was effort put into making it look like a video game, but it's just, it doesn't feel like it's a video game. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have a soul. And quite literally, it doesn't feel like it has a soul. Because, you know, I mentioned the thing about mutual respect between a game and its players. It feels like there's no relation there's no relationship between the game. I don't feel respected, but I also don't feel disrespected. It feels like this game is just here. It just is. It's just a thing. It's just it's not it's empty. That's a good way of putting it. It's pretty empty. I mean, you know, I, that's a little expected because it's just kind of a drive around racing game. But there is also still this sense of like not too much soul put into it. As a result, like you saw the building that I just drove past as well that we saw earlier. That's a hotel with no front door. Little things like that that make you feel like this is not really. This is not really a game meant to be enjoyed and loved. It's a game meant to be played. That's a good way of putting it. That's actually a really good way of putting it. This is not a game meant to be like enjoyed or loved. It's more or less a game that's just meant to be played, and that's it. I just ramped over a car. Well done, me. Oop. We're fine. We're fine. I miss, how you doing? <laughs> Hello, would you like to talk about our Lord and Savior, uh, Premier Yuri of, uh, Soviet Union? <laughs> Little Yuri's a reference there. Yeah. That's a pretty good way of putting it. It's actually kind of a different way of putting it as well, because Watch Dogs 2, I often find is bad, and I feel disrespected. And there's other games that I feel that are bad and soulless and disrespected. But this game is like, it's okay. And it's weird. It's a different type of bad game because it's actually not that bad. It's an okay game. It's just fine. It's just a fine game. The driving, feel, the driving feels nice. There's a great variety of vehicles. They've added a bunch of new things over the years, which, by the way, shouldn't be the norm in gaming, but it is. And it, it was, it was kind of, it was complete in the in the past. There's a lot of new stuff now, but it was complete in the past, complete-ish. And. Uh, you know, like for example, there's a whole, there's a, there's a uh, type of activity which is uh, police chasing, and it works like Burnout Paradise in that you don't have one set car you're chasing, you just have like infinitely spawning cars that you have to wreck and you have to reach a certain amount, and that was added later. But yeah, it's like, there's this sense in this game, because this game is actually not terrible. I mean, this is new as well. Like, uh, you will notice as well. Let's see, when I first started playing, there was like one race in San Francisco? Is that a Transformers reference? One shall remain. Interesting. Where is it? Is it here? Well, that's weird. Oh, okay, here it is. When I first started playing, there was like only this street race and this street race. And uh, you'll see on the... Uh, the magenta is where I went. The magenta is where I have gone. The, mag the magenta is my path, and the yellow path is the path of the race that I'm currently looking at. So, uh, previously, there were only a couple of races in San Francisco right here. But they've added this. They've added this, which is the police one, which I finished. Uh, this one's new. It's a hypercar race, which is interesting. Where does this go? 
God, can I, can I see? Can I hover over it, please? Here we go. Oh. Oh, it leaves San Francisco and goes all the way up there. Oh, that's what these purple things are. These must be like... Okay. All right. Oh, San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, touring car. Nope, I don't want it to set away. Wait, can I not access those? Can I not? Oh, yeah, play. Okay. That is cool. Community races are cool. They removed the motor pass thing. Pass thing. That's cool. They uh, added community races. That's re that's really cool. <laughs> you will notice as well. Uh, previously, this one, New York Hypercar, you'll notice it goes across the entire road I did. That goes to San Francisco. That's a really long race. And I really enjoy the long races. There's also another one that's like Chicago to Miami. And there's another one that's uh, Los Angeles to Seattle. I really enjoy the longer ones. And uh, it looks like so does the community. Because most of the most of the custom races that I've seen have been like cross country or city to city. Which is funny. <laughs> which is funny. You know, they made a map of the continental United States. They're going to use the whole... They paid for the whole... They paid for an entire map of the entire continental United States. They're going to use the entire continental United States. Yeah. So, yeah, once again, credit where credit's due. But, uh... And, yeah, credit where credit's due. This game is okay. It's a pretty... It's, it's good. It's okay. It's pretty good. If you got a bunch of friends and you like cars, it's pretty good. It's okay. It's not like simulator level. It's okay. You know what I mean? It's like the equivalent of, uh... It's like the equivalent of driving cross-country so you can... It's like, it's like, let's go with that. It's like the equivalent of fast food. It's the equivalent of driving cross-country and going to a truck stop and picking, like, a fast food place to eat at and, like, a good fast food place. And, uh... You know... You just, you just need something to eat, something to fill your stomach. You don't expect, like, legendary restaurant quality. But what you get doesn't taste horrible. It fills you up. It gets you going. It gets you going, gets you ready for the rest of the drive. It's okay. And it's kind of a weird feeling because I've never really had that situation of having one of the modern soulless games that's actually not that bad of a game on its own merit. Because even though this game is pretty, like, soulless and a little empty and kind of feels... It feels corporate. As I've said, there is this sense that this game was not crafted and designed by passionate by a passionate team. There's this sense that this game is run by a company and it was made to be played. The, and there's this sense that it was made to be played, not made to be loved. Let's go with that. That's a that's a great way of putting it. This game is a game that that's it's it's good. It's okay, but it was made to be played ultimately, not made to be loved. It was made to uh. It was made to run its course. It was made to get money from players in exchange for them playing it. And maybe one day it'll die. And that's kind of terrible. But yeah. It's the equivalent of... It's the equivalent of like... Trups, of, tr of decent truck stop fast food. And it's kind of disappointing. Because... Yeah. It's not that bad a game. This game is not that terrible. But I feel so hard for the people who had the crew won. And now got their freaking license revoked. I really hope that something comes of that. Once again, link in description for the petition to for that. Uh, it is stopkillinggames.com. If you have the crew one, you can go sign one of those. If you have the crew one and you live in any of the countries that are listed, then there's action you can take. And if you don't, then you can still take action by spreading the word to everyone you know. And eventually it will reach more people who have the crew one. And uh, the more people it reaches, the more signatures it will have. And... Uh, Hopefully this is the movement that will make something happen because it is an incredibly disgusting and terrible piece of anti-consumer rights that they think they can just axe an entire freaking game that people have paid money for. Oh, but it's online. Well, you see, this game was capable of being played offline or capable of being played without other people. And that means, and it had an offline mode. It should have been an obligation for the company to make the offline mode work and then allow the, and allow the offline mode to keep working. And then, of course, also, you know, whenever a game gets shut down or its multiplayer stops working, there will always be people who say, I don't, I don't want that. I, how about no? I'm going to mod the multiplayer to get it working again. People have done that with Command & Conquer, all the way with Command & Conquer. People have done that with Battlefield. People have done that with all kinds of games. And, you know, people should have the right to do that. Because if, pe if people like a game, they should have the right to play it. 
Simple as that. And it's terrible what Ubisoft did. So overall, this it didn't really mean to be. This didn't really mean to be like a Crew Two review or anything. But yeah. Also, Far Cry New Dawn. I should probably mention Far Cry New Dawn a little bit. I saw a video of it. Most soulless freaking corporate trash I've ever seen in my life. Like, it's post-apocalyptic, but still has that rural that rural feeling. And obviously, as well, there's like freaking. Why do the bad guys wear pink like motorcycle helmets? Come on. Come on. If they really wanted to make a realistic post-apocalyptic game, they would have them wear camouflage. And they didn't even have to. I mean, Fallout... You see, Fallout is an unrealistic post-apocalyptic game that did it of its own merit. That created a post-apocalyptic atmosphere of its own doing, of its own creation. Because Fallout is unrealistic. Because Fallout has the creativity of having things like power armor and laser rifles and things. But Far Cry New Dawn did not create... Uh, pink and yellow and light blue trucks or so out of its own creativity. It did it because it's like, oh, it's got to be flashy and sell more because it's the corporate trends or something stupid. Yeah. I would talk more about Far Cry New Dawn if I owned it, but I do not. I only, I do not have any Far Cry game. I believe I have Far Cry 3, but I haven't tried it yet. So, yeah. And also, something else that I would like to point out. That I think I already did, but I will again. Even though this game is pretty okay, even though it is ultimately corporate soulless empty slop, it's okay corporate soulless empty slop. It's uh, it's not it's not bad, you know. The times I got on with friends and then just cruised this half hour long trek to San Francisco, it was fun. It was okay. The times I did that were okay, but ultimately at the end, this is a game that's meant to be played, not meant to be enjoyed. And some of the many ways you can see that is the fact that all the cities look very generic and sort of not very high, not very high detail in the cities. And also the fact that obviously, you know, you have the, the magenta freestyle, the light blue, light blue pro racing. Can I select it, please? Thank you. And the yellow street racing. Most the orange off-roading. <laughs> yeah, it's very flashy. Hmm. Honestly, I'm kind of at the end of the video now. What the heck is that? Oh, that's a glitch that used to happen. Sometimes friends... Sometimes friends will, like, phantom appear down there. I don't know. But, yeah. That's the crew, too. That's my video yelling about Ubisoft and yelling about game design again. It's, uh... I... <laughs> I don't know what that even know what to say. I've, I've ranted and rambled, said everything I wanted to say. There really isn't that much left. There really isn't that much left. I don't really know what to say. You know, Watch Dogs 2 is corporate and soulless, and it's also bad in a way. There are parts of it that try to be good, but it's bad. And then there's this game, which might just be gone in a few years unless we do something about it, which I hope something does get done about it. And uh, even though this game is okay, it is still corporate slop. I, like, make no mistake. This is not like a deep experience. It's not like a great video game. It's just an o it's just an okay, you know, drive cars around game. As I've been saying. Nice little view of San Francisco right there, or the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, yeah, I don't really know what else to say. I'm mad at Ubisoft. I'm mad at Ubisoft for doing this. I'm mad at Ubisoft because I was watching New Dawn and I literally thought at certain points this looks just like The Crew 2 and this looks just like Watch Dogs 2. It's exactly like what I said in the Mega Rant. Like, there's this sense of they're all the same universe, but they're spin-offs of each other. There's this sense of it being the same universe. Not Obviously, you can tell they're not the same game. You know, one's a racing game, one's a shooter, one's a third-person open world game. But there really is this sense that it's like the same universe. They look samey. They look so samey. And I realized Ubisoft looks the Ubisoft games look the most samey, and they look the most samey. They look the most soulless. They look the most corporate. They look the most magenta, yellow, light blue. They're like the worst offender of it all. And uh, and then you know, as the last straw of that, as the last straw, they killed the crew one. The crew one is gone, and uh, people are really mad, and so am I. I'm mad because I believe in what Watch Dogs could have been. I Watch Dogs 1 was a pretty good game. I believe Watch Dogs 2 could have been a much better sequel. 
could have been an even better sequel. It could have had everything Watch Dogs 1 had. Nope, but instead, you know, we got we got driving a car around the streets of San Francisco, blasting terrible luck while being chased by the police. And then, the, you know, then there's Far Cry and there's whatever. There's probably other Ubisoft series that I don't know or forgot about, like Driver. Like, Driver at least has the grace of not having any new games, so they don't... So they aren't bad. To be fair, though, I think I heard something that Watch Dogs 1 was originally built to be the next Driver game after San Francisco. Which is why the police AI are so, like, good at driving in Watch Dogs 1 and Watch Dogs 2. Which makes sense. But, yeah. There's also Assassin's Creed. I don't play Assassin's Creed personally. I know nothing about it. I'm assuming that's probably not doing too well either. I don't know. It's just Ubisoft is like the king of slot. EA is the king of just being terrible, but Ubisoft has become also the king of slot. I don't know. I'm going to be breaking these barrels, by the way. Ah, it's funny. Man. You know what? I don't really think I have anything else to say. That is it. That's the end of the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next one. Don't worry, I'm sure I'll play some, I will play and do something much happier and much more fun in the next video. I'm thinking I'll either do a username or plays games on games that I really like, or maybe I'll uh, continue Cursed Halo Reach that I did not forget about. Fun fact. Maybe I'll do that for the next videos. But in the meantime, I'm going to... I'm going to not fall in the water. I'm going to drive to the edge of this tiny little peninsula. And I'm going to look over the city of San Francisco, which has no Salesforce tower. Nice. That 555 California Street, though? Oh. Oh, no, okay. All right. Uh, the tallest building on the left right there. I think that's 555 California Street, which is not there in real life. In real life, I believe it's, like, over there. <laughs> Neat San Francisco facts. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Do not buy Ubisoft games, you know, no matter how good or bad or okay they may be. Do not buy Ubisoft games. Do not give them any no any money. Do not support this. Even though this game is okay, I still will not spend money on it. And, uh, yeah, maybe one day Ubisoft will make passionate good games again. Maybe we'll get a good Watch Dogs again. But probably not. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just disappointed. I'm just disappointed. But yes, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.